Welcome to the Eat Well, Sleep Great, Run Far podcast. My name is Will Franz, and I'm here to help you go farther, faster, and longer without injuries, gut problems, or giving up your favorite foods. This episode was originally recorded as a weekly live in the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition group on Facebook. If you'd like to join these lives, watch past replays, or get any of the written summaries I do for these weekly, please head to the link in the show notes, drop me a comment. I'm happy to help you out. Now, let's get on with the episode. We are live. Today is going to be more of a grab bag of topics. I don't have like one individual thing we're going to talk about. But first, I just want to say I spent Saturday working at Behind the Rocks in Moab, Utah. And if you are able to volunteer to race, you should absolutely go do that. You get to meet great people. You get to help them out. You even might get to earn a free or discounted race entry. And it's all a great time, right? While I was out there, I was reminded of why this sport can be so cool. There is a supportive community of people all trying to do really hard shit. They're trying to push themselves. They're trying to find their limits. They're trying to figure out what they can do. And I just really appreciated that and it kind of spoke to me. So this this week I'm running a you can call it a scholarship offer. You get three months, one person is going to get three months of free coaching, and then 10 more people are going to get a huge discount. And if you're wondering, like, am I good enough to deserve coaching? Yep. I don't really care where you are on your journey. If you're passionate about this sport and really want to make improvements, fast track your process or progress rather and hit those goals, then you deserve coaching. If you don't want one, it's fine. If you don't want a coach, that's a whole different story. You don't need one. It just kind of fast tracks your progress and makes sure you move in the right direction. But everybody deserves it. So that's why I offer free guides. That's why I put out this stuff. And that's why I've decided to offer this opportunity this week. So if you're interested, drop a comment or shoot me a message and I'll get you the link to apply. Anyway, let's get rolling on this week. First, <laughs> this weekend was hot. So we're going to talk about hydration a little bit. Heat played a huge role for some people as to whether they finished or suffered or where it was. Spring can be one of the hardest times. I know it's not like strictly as hot as summer, but you have no transfer time. There were some people who had been training all winter in like at most 40 degrees and then you get dropped directly into an 85, 90 degree day, very exposed in the desert of Moab, kind of kicks you hard. Running the heat is never exactly easy, but when you've been doing it for a few months, your body's at least created some adaptations and worked to get used to the heat. Whereas in spring, a lot of people will often go directly from winter functionally to summer, and <clears throat> it can be a suffer fest. I saw everything from cramping to vomiting to low-level heat illness, and all of this to say is if it's starting to warm up where you are significantly and you haven't done a sweat test in a while, you should probably do one of those to start figuring out your hydration. Weigh yourself naked before you go out on a normal 60-minute run, the closer to your typical race pace, the better. Weigh yourself naked when you get back. Subtract the water you consumed. And that should help you get some starting target of how much you need to drink per hour in those conditions. <clears throat> I've done at least one of these about hydration. I've also written a whole guide on the topic. So I'm not going to dive too much deeper here. But So if you want those resources, please check them out. Shoot me a message. They're out there. They're free for a reason. I want you to be able to hydrate well, so that is not your limiting factor. That said, please be careful about your hydration as we start to shift into these hotter temperatures, especially if you're running in the desert or far away from water sources. Heat illness can come on very quickly and be incredibly dangerous. I don't care how long your run is, unless you know for a fact that you'll be near a source of water, or have some access to people, please take water with you, especially if you're going alone. Heat illness can start to set in as little as like 30 to 45 minutes in the right climate, and then you get sick, which means you get confused, 
and that means you can get lost and that can easily lead to death. So please take care of yourself. Take water as we're moving into the summer. So if heat's a factor in your race, you'll likely need to do two primary things. One, drink more fluid. Some of the water you drink isn't necessarily going to help you with hydration. Clearly, we drink fluid to hydrate, but it also is a big regulator of your temperature. So when you're out there, please refill with preferably cold water at every aid station and bump up your consumption a little bit. If you haven't done a sweat test, you'll have to eyeball it. You don't want to be sloshing around, but consistent increased consumption is going to help you with that temperature regulation. You might also just need to slow down a bit. If something's actively going wrong, this is almost always the first plan of attack, whether it be a pain, a niggle, um, hydration problems, gut issues. Drop to a walk for like 15 to 20 minutes. We're not talking like a race walk or a power hike, more of a mosey. Keep moving, but give your legs a bit of a rest. Let your blood recirculate and give yourself a chance to recover a bit before you start hammering at it again. Now, if we're in a really rough spot, ice is going to be your friend. So most people put ice in their hat or like a cold towel around the neck. Great choices. But your hands are also a big source of thermal regulation. The skin on your hands, your feet, and this upper part of your face where you don't grow hair, they all are, um, have very specific ability to regulate your temperature. So if you're overheating, grab some ice in your hands and hold on to it until you start until they start to become uncomfortable. They, if somebody else touched them, they should feel cold to the touch. And that will help regulate your temperature very quickly. They've actually done lab tests where they cool the palms of the hands. You see massive performance increases with no other changes. No changes in fueling, no changes in training, just cooling the hands. So it can really help you to regulate temperature across the board. Now be careful with all of that. If you're sweaty, um, you're covering yourself in ice, and you're in the shade, and there's a breeze, there's actually a high possibility that you're going to overshoot a bit, cool yourself down too quickly, and some people have gotten hypothermic here. So take a little time, maybe pick one strategy at a time, and then see how we're doing. Regulate the core temperature, bring yourself down, so that you have a chance to get back after it. Cool. So heat aside. I've also been getting a couple questions about travel over the past probably two weeks. So a few thoughts on travel. If you're traveling far, like to a different country, um, what can we do? Well, the best thing you can do is to arrive a few days early because your circadian rhythm is going to be all messed up and you have a chance of waking up at, you know, one in the morning and just being all messed up. So that would be ideal. If you can't do that, we want to try to get on the destination time clock as quickly as possible. So this really depends on when your flight is, but if you're going to land in the morning, you can try to sleep on the plane. I am a miserable failure at sleeping in any sort of seated position, so it's not much of an option for me. Your other option is to try to stay awake the extra number of hours you need to make it to nighttime there. But the faster you can push your body to get on that time clock of the, clock of the race, the better. I say this is someone who used to travel a lot. I used to spend my summers like disappearing out of this country and before COVID. And that was always my strategy. I'd keep awake for the extra time, push it, and then like very much minimize jet lag compared to other people I know. You can also use a few other things to expedite the process a little bit. So movement and food and light are big signalers of your circadian rhythm. So try and start eating on the time schedule, like figure out the transfer, start eating on the time schedule that you would in a new place. As soon as you get there, if it's morning, have some food. It doesn't need to be anything big, but have some food to like instigate that cortisol pattern. And try and get out in the sunlight. If we get some sunlight in our eyes, that's going to help a lot as well and move. Like anything we can do to boost cortisol in the morning. If it's evening, we want kind of the exact opposite. Food's still there, but we want to have a more carb heavy to drop that cortisol. We want to really reduce movement, maybe some mobility to find it relaxing, some kind of yin yoga, and 
minimize light exposure as much as you can. So we really just want to target anything we can do to get ourselves on the time schedule of the destination. This would be typically avoiding naps, um, anything that is going to mess this up, right? There are too many options to list here. If you really want to dial in some specifics, message me. I'm happy to help. But the big thing is try and switch that rhythm to your destination, and the earlier the better. So if you have a day off work but you're not traveling yet, consider trying to fall asleep earlier or wake up earlier or like make that shift. Now, in addition to the time issue, when you travel, you're very likely to end up dehydrated or making poor food choices or sitting down for very long stretches of time. So first, let's jump back in and address the hydration thing, especially if you are on a plane. A plane is exceptionally dehydrating because of all the recycled air. This is one of the reasons that air travel can really push you towards getting sick. Yes, there's a lot of exposure to other people and their germs, but you also get dried out, which leads to a sore, scratchy throat. So if we can drink a bunch of water, then you would do a lot better at staying less sick and staying more hydrated. This means getting up fairly often to go like track some down. Great. If it means bringing a few bottles and filling them up after security, great. Whatever's going to help you. It very likely means you're going to need to get up more often to go to the restroom, and that is fine. You need to stay hydrated if you want to perform well after traveling on a plane. And on the like getting up more often to go to the bathroom note, we want to be doing that anyway. If you're sitting for hours upon hours, legs like, start to atrophy, they start to cramp, all of that. So we need to actually get up. If you're driving, this means pulling over every hour or two and probably spending five minutes on mobility. I will often do some sort of pigeon pose on the hood of my car, put a, put a knee up there, sink into it, get my hip flexor moving. It's a particularly weak spot for me. I'll also hit my calves because they're also really tight. You need to know what you works for you and what's going to be necessary. But if you take five minutes every hour or two, it's going to help you. On a plane, take a lap around the plane, be that person that stands like next to that back exit door and stretch a little bit every 60 to 90 minutes. Be that person. Don't let your legs get all crampy because you don't want to get up or bother someone. Try and stay mobile. Lastly, food. Traveling can really mess up your food for a whole bunch of reasons, right? So we need to make some food choices that'll help you hit your goals. For me, this often means taking some food with me. Try and avoid the like cheap or free airplane food if you don't know what it's going to be. Worst case, you have extra food that you don't eat, and then you eat the free food they give you, and then you have something upon landing. But bring some prep, bring some options. You're, it's very hard to go wrong with some fruit, vegetables, protein, like some reliable source of carbohydrate, right? So like a sandwich. I will typically travel with some, with at least one sandwich with some vegetables, right? And that's kind of what I'm gonna go for. And it's a very easy thing to bring with you that will make it through just fine. And it's gonna help you a lot to not have to rely on, you know, Cheez-Its as your only food source over the course of a few hours. A lot of the time, if I'm just traveling, I will fast when I travel, but if you're heading to a race, that can force you to miss an opportunity to top off your glycogen stores, which is gonna affect your performance. So here we really do wanna bring some food, give ourselves an option. The more options you have, the better, right? It's really what we're looking for. And that actually brings me a little bit to carb loading. So a few people have been asking me about carb loading as we're moving into races and how, if it even matters, and if so, like how we do that properly. So there's a long history of loading carbs before events. Like when I was in college, we would all get together and eat a gigantic pasta dinner before going out and playing a tournament over the weekend. And carb loading is important, but that is not the way to do it. So if you've been following me for a while, I'm a fan of carb cycling, the idea that you should have higher carb days and lower carb days depending on your training, right? Like we should eat the fuel that's actually going to support training and recovery. And for most of us, that is going to help, or carbs are going to help that to some degree. And cycling them just makes a bunch of sense, especially for ultra athletes where 
your energy output on some days might be well over 4,000 calories, and some of your rest days are going to be easily half that, right? If we cycle our carbohydrate to make up a lot of that difference, it tends to do a lot of good. So unless you're consistently training over three hours per day, we want to have this cycle. And one of the best places to have a higher carb intake is the few days prior to your race, right? So like long runs, recovery days, and a couple days prior to your race, just top everything off. So about two days out, your glycogen is on a 36 to 48 hour recovery window. And this is true for most people. The exact number depends on you and your history and a whole bunch of factors but it's somewhere in the 36 to 48 hour range for most people. Now, if you increase your carbohydrate intake throughout the day, starting about two, two days before your event, you're going to carb load just fine. This shouldn't be slamming large dinners of pasta for two days. It means having a little more carbohydrate at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and maybe some snacks. It's gonna feel like a little more than you're used to, probably, but it's going to help you to top off all of those energy stores that you will put to good use on race day. And again, choose good sources, choose sources that work for you. If you know pizza causes you a bunch of bloating, then don't choose pizza. Some of my go-tos are white rice, potatoes, oatmeal. You have to find something that works for you, but don't plan to load a ton of carbohydrate all in one meal the day prior. Start a little earlier, Give your body some time to digest and fuel and store that stuff as well as you can. So past carb loading, I've also been having a bunch of conversations with people about pain lately. And first, I'd like to note that I'm by no means a doctor nor a PT. My dad was a physical therapist. He knew more about certain movement patterns than I ever will. And he just it's what he does, right? Like that's what he did. That's what they're they're qualified to do. I'm a personal trainer who has been injured quite a bit in my life. So I've had a lot of PT done to me. I watch people move. We find like muscles that are gonna help that, but I'm not a diagnostician, right? So if you are really struggling, go see someone. That'd be the first thing I have to say. But the first question that they should probably ask you is where is the pain? This is the question you should be asking yourself. And we need to be specific here. So my knee hurts is not particularly helpful. My knee hurts below the kneecap on the inside edge of my leg is a lot more helpful. We need to figure out where we're experiencing the pain because the pain right above your kneecap and right below your kneecap can actually be caused by different things. Once we know that, we can start to diagnose a little bit. So if we're having that pain right below the kneecap, then it could be a sign of many things, but one of the most common one is a weak glute med and or weak quads. Both of those can lead to your knee tracking too far forward and a little bit inward and putting pressure on that area when you run, putting pressure on those tendons, right? So how do we find out? Again, go see a PT. It's what they do. They'll put you through an assessment and figure out your particular issues so that we can do some exercises that's going to help. But the answer almost never is suck it up and run through it. Typically the answer is some version of drop your load, drop your intensity, stay active, and strengthen whatever is responsible for your problem. Right? If your knees cave inward, then we wanna focus on strengthening those glute meds and some of your quads so that we don't have that inward knee cave when we work. But if you have a problem with plantar fasciitis, then we want, might wanna strengthen your calves and feet. If you have shin splints, it is very likely calves in your tibialis anterior. We need to figure out where the pain is very specifically to make our next moves and then get someone to look at it so they can figure out how you move. And this brings me a bit to running gait. So I've had a couple conversations lately about running gait or form while running. And the question always takes some form of like, is there a correct running gait or is there a correct running form? And the answer is probably, but only relevant to you. Like there are a few general statements we can make about gait. 
for one, we shouldn't overstride, right? Like we shouldn't be reaching really far out in front of ourselves with our foot and kind of pulling backwards. It's really likely you're gonna end up with problems. When you run, we should land with our foot underneath our center of mass. If you're re reaching, you're more likely to get injured in a whole variety of ways. But this is not the same as saying heel striking is bad. Everyone heel strikes, especially on the downhills. It's not the heel striking that's causing you issues. I mean, it could be. If you have particularly weak tendons, heel striking has been shown to put a little more stress. Um, if you have a little more propensity towards stress fracture, that landing on your heel, going directly through your heel bone, can put a little more stress. So we might need to make some adjustments depending on you, but probably not. Heel striking is, is fine. It's not the heel striking that's causing the issues. It's the fact that when a lot of people land on their heel, they have reached too far with their foot. We can also say something about leaning forward, right? So when you run, we should have a forward lean. Running is functionally, a, you're falling a lot of times and catching yourself repeatedly. But that lean should come from your ankle more than anything else. We shouldn't be leaning forward at the hips. We shouldn't be like rounding the upper back and finding that lean there should lean forward at the ankle. And if we have an inability to create a bunch of flexion in our ankle, this can actually cause problems, right? Like you don't need a ton, you don't need to be able to squat all the way down and sit in the bottom of the squat like almost every elderly person did while I was in Korea, but we need to have some ankle flexion that's gonna allow you to run properly. We also shouldn't be bouncing up and down like a kangaroo. We wanna stay fairly level, more like, I mean, watch a cheetah run. They're, they're very smooth. And all of that is going to look different for everyone. But that doesn't mean form doesn't matter. Of course, form matters. Like we should, by saying you should have good form, it's different from saying you should have this form. We can compare it to throwing a football. Every quarterback's throw looks a little different based on how they're built, how tall they are, all of that but nobody takes the ball, palms it sideways, and hucks it from their chest. There are wrong ways to do things. So if you have to spend a little time on your form, I really recommend you commit to it. You will probably see some short-term regression. You'll probably have to slow down, but really like put in the work, it can be, it can be a bit of a pain, but it will help you in the long run. Training to finish like a single ultra can be, can look different than training to become a better runner. And sometimes that means doing a bit of slow, boring work. If, and that said, if there's nothing wrong with your gait, if you're not experiencing pain, if you're pretty happy with where you are, don't mess with it. I am not a fan of trying to fix what's not broken, right? And that is absolutely as applicable to gait as it is to everything else. A couple people have asked me about ice and or heat therapy. And a simple way to look at this is when we're doing anything in regards to training, we can either be trying to target adaptation or optimization. And I got this idea from Andy Galpin, who is an incredible um, researcher and trainer and all sorts of stuff. So when you're doing something for your training, you're either trying to optimize your performance or create an adaptation that will lead to better performance down the line. But we're not doing both at the same time. So like adjusting your gait is a perfect example of trying to create some form of adaptation. Doing heavy strength work to get stronger is trying to create some sort of adaptation. So whereas using your current gait to run as fast as possible is an example of optimization. When it comes to ice and heat, they do different things on these spectrums. Ice helps immediate recovery but it greatly inhibits your adaptation. It is an in-the-moment optimization strategy. So if you're running a six-day race and you're on day three and everything hurts, then ice can be great. It will reduce that inflammation and help you get through the rest of the race. Same thing if you're on mile 50 of um, 100. Ice might be your friend there if you're finding the swelling. Baseball pitchers ice their arms all the time when they're in season because they have to pitch the next day. It is a brutal sport for a pitcher, but they're also not trying to get better at pitching in that moment. They're trying to perform. The hay's in the barn, right? They're trying to put their training to use. 
So if you're six months out from your race and you're trying to make improvements, you should actually really avoid ice within four to six hours of a training session. Maybe in general, but there can be some benefits to cold showers and all sorts of stuff. But if you are doing a heavy training session and then immediately putting ice on something, you are going to limit your ability to adapt and get better. If you are in so much pain that you need ice that far out from your race, you likely need to make some adjustments to your training regimen. On the other hand, heat can actually be really helpful here. To create an adaptation, we actually want inflammation, and then we want the body to recover from that inflammatory response. That is largely how, that is a large factor of how adaptation works. So heat, can boost that. So it's not one or the other. One is not better than the other. It really depends on the situation. And we can actually use them a little bit in tandem. So if you are trying to reduce inflammation, you can actually cycle ice and heat. And there's a whole, whole system and whole theory to that that is longer than we're getting it into here. But again, one is not better than the other. They're different. So another thing was sleep, right? So I've done a long post on sleep. I'm not going to go off on it here, but most people just don't have the time with all of their training and life and job to necessarily sleep more. So if you do fine on like six hours of sleep pretty regularly, great. That might not be optimal, but sometimes it's a trade-off you make as someone who's not getting paid a bunch of money to do a sport. But when you're in the week leading up to your race, we can do something called sleep loading. About seven to 10 days before your race, really focus on upping your sleep to about the out eight hour range as much as possible. You should already be in a taper, so it shouldn't take away from your training. You should have the time. And they've shown that when Olympians up their sleep the week prior to competition, they got better results. A lot of Olympians will sleep five to six hours a night because they're training so much. And then when they went towards final competition, they upped about nine hours results improved immensely. So we can do some version of sleep loading. It might not be optimal, but it might be the best you're able to do, and it can definitely help. And then, last topic before I get into a question I was at, like a specific question I was asked is like the most underappreciated thing when it comes to race performance, and I would argue confidence, right? There's a huge mental factor to all sports I have definitely choked in the past, and it doesn't feel right. So if you are not confident, you're not gonna perform your best. So this is one of the biggest benefits to a good training regimen. Yes, it creates physical adaptations. Yes, it helps you get to your nutrition line, but it also lets you know that you've done the work and that you're ready to perform. One strategy I've heard from a lot of people is some concept of what quote fear setting take some time weekly preferably to imagine what might go wrong um, your water bladder breaks you fall your pole snaps in half your shoe rips really stack up these problems i like to put them in a google sheet google spreadsheet and you'll have problems on the left and on the right we will solve those problems to the best of our ability you can also do this old school with just a basic t-shirt and figure out how you're going to solve them. Sometimes it might come down to, pardon me, sometimes it might come down to having some backup equipment. Other times it's getting in line with your crew as to what you need or your pacer. We often hear about the values of positive visualization, like imagining what you're going to do in your race or any event you're doing. And while that can be really helpful, it can be equally maybe not more valuable to visualize what happens when things go wrong. A lack of confidence almost always comes down to being un underprepared or completely unprepared for the unknown. So if we can get mentally prepared and have some ways to handle things, create the doomsday situations, then solve them weeks or months before your race, the better. The more situations you can solve, the better you'll be in the moment. Like we'll all fall to the level of preparation when shit gets really hard. So if we can create some preparation, we're just going to do a lot better. So if you have any questions now, please pop them in the chat and I will try to answer them before we close out here. First one from Fabiola is, does napping count in regards to sleep? 
yeah, it does. Um, not, it's different for different people. I'm a terrible napper. It actually doesn't help me. It makes me not able to sleep at night. It's not great. If naps do really well for you, yes, they can be super helpful. And I'd say there's a couple strategies here. One would be a shorter nap, like probably sub 30 minutes for most people. It's going to help you get a little bit of a recharge. Or if you have the time to take about an hour and a half nap, it'll let you get through a pretty good sleep cycle in the middle of your day. And that can help quite a bit. So yes, if naps do well for you, that can be a great addition. A lot of athletes and like high performers absolutely take a nap in the middle of their day because they'll sleep very little at night, they'll train, they'll do some work, they'll have a they'll have a time to break for one reason or another. So they'll take an hour or a nap or so, and then we'll get back to work and continue their day. So if that works for you, it absolutely counts. Yes. And then one more question that I had from DM to me was about like recovery windows and food. So I've said in the past that one of the most important things you can do is not miss your post-training meal. I like a shake, it should have some protein in it, it should have some carbohydrate in it. And I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding here, so I just wanted to, wanted to clear up. It's not like you're missing something entirely if you don't eat some food after your training, right? Like overall intake throughout your day is what is going to matter most. If you get a perfect post-workout or post-training meal, but then you're still really low the rest of your day, that is way worse. I would much rather your food intake be solid across the day than to completely dial in your post-training meal. That said, the question was, if things take days to heal, like aren't, isn't the body gonna take ingested protein to that spot anyway? Is it just more efficient or fast right after the tears occur? And then also obviously after a longer event, you're recovering for much longer, so do we have the same rules? Is there a different type of recovery? And the real, real answer here is the protein post training session is really to stop the muscle breakdown. That's it. If you can get a boost of leucine that will instigate muscle protein synthesis, you're gonna stop your muscle bro breakdown a lot faster. It will eventually taper off on its own, but you can maintain a little more muscle and create a little less damage if we get some protein directly after your training session. And then the carbohydrate directly after your training session is especially important if you are going to train again with the next 24 hours. It doesn't need to be a ton. We're just trying to restore glycogen and then more importantly, drop cortisol. So if you've done an intense training session, cortisol is gonna be high. And let's not even call it intense, difficult. If you've done a difficult training session, cortisol is gonna be high. That could be a long run, it could be speed work. It's not you know, a 60 minute easy pace, cruisy run, but speed work, long runs, they all are gonna crank your cortisol. So if we can get some carbohydrate after that, it's gonna drop your cortisol. It will also have the nice bonus of topping off your glycogen stores a little faster. Within about a day, day and a half, your body will figure out how to top them off enough anyway. But most ultra runners rarely go a full 24 to 36 hours between training sessions. Most people are gonna train five, six times in a week. So we can get some carbohydrate in directly after that, we're gonna drop cortisol, and then it'll allow that next training session the following day to be a lot better. So yes, the overall intake is what's gonna matter most, but timing is how we can like narrow in a little bit, especially if we're trying to, if we have busy lives or we're trying to pull everything out that we can. Cool, that's all I have for, day, for today. There's nothing else in the chat. Really appreciate y'all being here. And I will be back next week with something else. If you are interested in three free months of coaching, please shoot me a message or post a comment here and I will absolutely get you the link to apply. Thank you so much and I'll talk to you later. Thank you for listening to the show. To be clear, I'm not a doctor nor a registered dietitian and nothing you heard was medical advice. You should always speak with a qualified medical professional before making any changes to your training regimen. If you enjoy the podcast or found it useful, please take a couple seconds to give it a rating or share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. And if you want more of this information, please head to the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition Group on Facebook. You'll be in good company with other like-minded people who like to do hard stuff outside.